Hello and welcome to another Ginger Mathematician video. We're going to finish off this paper by doing questions 15, 16 and 17. If you like this kind of IB high level content, then please do like and subscribe. Liking being the most important thing. Right, let's go on to question 15 with a slope field. So for the following differential equation here, uh, sine x plus y, and we're given two of the solutions, so called riding the waves of the slope field, as you can see here. And for the two solutions given, we're given local max minimum points and maximum points are lying on the straight line. So let's just draw this in. So um, we've got the minimum points here, roughly speaking, and here, roughly speaking. And what it's saying here is they make a straight line. So if I just draw the straight line in, like so, and we need to find the equation of that red line. And now if I draw in the blue line, so the maximum, again, this is just not to scale, but just to give you an idea of what we're looking for here and here. And if I do a blue line like so, not the best blue line I've ever drawn in the world, and you'll see it goes through roughly there. Again, it's not going to be to scale. And what we need to do is find the equation, first of all, of L1. So write that in, L1, and then the equation of L2. So just to give you a visual representation of what we're looking for. Now remember that the maximum and minimum here are turning points. And if we know that they're turning points, let me go on to the next slide here, then we know the gradient at that point as well. So four turning points, I write this in, whether they're minimum or maxima, then we know that dy by dx is equal to zero. So we have the equation here, so sine x plus y, and therefore we know for both the maximums and minima that sine x plus y is equal to zero. So if to solve this, then what's the opposite of signing something? Well, it's going to be inverse signing on both sides. That gives us, well, this cancels, so we get x plus y is equal to the inverse sine of zero. Now, what is that? Let me draw a quick diagram to show you what we're actually looking for here. So if I draw the sine curve, that we should know off by heart. Of course, this is a calculator paper. So again, you can use the calculator to draw sine. And let's pop this in. I'm going to use radians here. So this is pi over 2. This is pi. This is 3 pi over 2. And this is 2 pi. So 90, 180, 270, and 360. The graph looks like this. So it goes up from 0 to pi over 2, then comes back down at pi and then down to 3 pi over 2 at minus 1, and then back up to uh, 0 at 2 pi. And basically what we're looking for is the solutions at 0. So this is fairly straightforward to see now. So 0 is a solution. So when it's x is 0, then the function is 0, also at pi and also at 2 pi as well. So the solutions to this are x plus y is equal to 0 pi, 2 pi, and actually it just carries on every uh, pi radians, or 180 degrees, dot, dot, dot. So the solution to this is x plus y is equal to 0, x plus y is equal to pi, and if we want to continue, if we needed it, x plus y is equal to 2 pi, and so on. So if we solve the first two equations we have here, and write it in the form y equals mx plus c, then we get the equations by minusing x on both sides here. We get the first equation, which is just y equals minus x, nice and straightforward. And here, if we do the same process, so minus x on both sides, then we get y is equal to minus x plus pi. And now let's look at these equations and see how that looks on our graph. Well, first of all, you notice here there is no y-intercept. So this really matches up with L1 very, very nicely. So our first one here, just by inspection, is that y is equal to minus x because it passes through 0, 0. Whereas if we look at this graph here, I mean, I haven't drawn it particularly well, this L2 line, but if we go to our minus x plus pi, well, that makes a lot of sense for pi to be our y-intercept. Notice where it crosses here. This is not very well done, but it looks like it could certainly cross at about 3.14. Again, my diagram isn't really done that well. But notice this actually fits the conditions that I'm looking for, despite me not drawing it very well. And this clearly looks like y equals minus x plus pi. 
because it crosses here at 3.14 and again has a very similar gradient to here again you shouldn't believe the <laughs> the two lines that I've drawn here so actually I've managed to solve both a and b here really neatly where l1 is going to be this one here y equals minus x and then l2 is going to be this one here at y equals minus x plus pi. Because they are turning points, both the minimums and the maximums, dy by dx is zero. And so I take the first two solutions from that to give me myself my L1 and L2. So L1 is going to equal y equals minus x, whereas L2 is going to equal y equals minus x plus pi. I think that's a really nice explanation of exactly what's going on in this slope field question. So you can see the mark scheme there. Again, the mark scheme is not very helpful to you. Hopefully my explanation has been uh, useful so you can actually understand where these answers are actually coming from. Okay, and question 16. So a nice graph theory question. So an ant is walking along the edges of a wireframe in the shape of triangular prism, and they've drawn out this graph below to represent the situation. And now we need to write down the adjacency matrix M for this graph. So we've got A, B, C, D, E, and F. So we've got six vertices. So we have a six by six matrix. So let's get ourselves lots of room here. So what I'm going to do to help me actually do this is I'm going to write A, B, C, D, E, and F at the top. And then I'm going to write here A, B, C, D, E, and F like so. So when I do fill in this very, very big matrix, uh, you can actually see what's going on. So let's get started on this. First of all, notice there are no loops in this graph. So all the diagonals are going to be zero. So zero, 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 zero. And now we just need to be really, really careful about how we actually pop in the rest of the values. So I'll stick with blue for the time being. So from A to B, we have one root. Again, we're looking for direct roots here. A to C is also one. And it's gonna be a symmetry here. A to D is one and then zero, zero here. And then we now look at B. So B to A, we have got one. So you've got this symmetry going on with the graph. And B to C is also one. B to D is zero, B E does exist though, and B F doesn't, zero. Now we look at C, so C to A, there is one, and to B as well, so one, one. C to D, there isn't, there isn't for E either, but then we've got a one here. There we go, D, and you just gotta be very patient with this, so D to A, there is one. D to B there isn't, D to C there isn't, so zero, zero, and then E and F there is both one, one. Let's now do E, so E doesn't go to A directly, does go to B, not C, so that's going to be zero, one, zero, and then one's for the rest because it goes to D and F, and now we do our final row here, F, so F goes to not A and B, so zero, zero, it does go to C, and it does go to the other two, so we get one, one. So I'm just gonna check the marks here, make sure I've done that correctly. Good, and now we need to work out the number of ways the ant can start at vertex A and walk along exactly six edges. Now the most important thing is exactly, not at least or anything like that, but exactly six edges. So we're looking for M to the power of six in order to return to A. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna work out what the matrix M to the power of six is. So we're gonna put this into the graphical calculator and then we're going to look at this value because we want to get back to A and see what number that is at the top left-hand corner. So let's go and put this into my graphical calculator. Okay, so let's put this in. So we've got menu. We're going to go to matrix, create, create matrix. We're going to go for a huge six by six matrix here. And we're just going to put this in very carefully. So don't press the enter button is something to recommend. So let's pop this in. If you're liking this content as well, then please do think about liking and subscribing. One. 
just be patient, making sure there are no errors. As you do this in the exam, you'll be under pressure, I'm sure. Zero, one, and then we just go zero, zero. One, 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 zero. So we've got a matrix, and now we're gonna raise this to the power of six. So you just go to that button there, to the power of six, and you get this huge matrix here. Now, I don't think you need to copy all of this in the exam, but certainly to give an indication you're working at m to the power of six here. So notice this top number here. I'm gonna take a screenshot and pop this in. So there we are, there is m to the power of six. And again, like I said here, we got the top left value. So that's 143. So the answer to our question, uh, there are 843 ways in total. Just a nice clear sentence to represent exactly what we're looking for. Okay, and you can check the mark scheme there. Yeah, some evidence of calculating M6 is all that's needed for that method mark. Okay, and on to the hardest question on the paper. It's question 17. And it's a nice mixture of working with some logarithms, but also some transformations of functions as well. So the graph of the function f of x is equal to the natural log of x is translated by the vector a, b, which we'll come back to later, so that then it passes through the point 0, 1, and e uh, cubed 1 plus natural log of 2. And somehow we need to work out what a and b are. So the first thing is we need to actually discuss what does the translation by a, b actually look like in terms of functions. So remember the a here is moving in the x direction and b is moving in the y direction. So we can translate this into f of x minus a plus b. You're probably familiar from working from the form I've just written two vectors, but you also need to be able to put that the other way around. So what this expression means here so if I highlight here the minus a and plus b, this basically means a translation by the vector positive a, b. So I'm exploiting this fact by actually working the other way around. So the first thing I need to do is actually write f of x minus a plus b and see how that actually applies to the natural log of x. So the minus a goes inside the function, so the natural log of x minus a, and then the b stays outside the function. Once I have this function, then I can substitute in 0, 1, and e cubed 1 plus natural log of 2 to essentially form two equations that I can then work with. So let's start with the first value. So when x is equal to 0, then f of x is equal to 1. What does that mean in this case? Well, wherever I see an x, I'm going to put a 0. So natural log of minus a plus b is equal then to 1. So that's going to be my first equation there. And now let's do exactly the same process for the other value. So when x is equal to e cubed, then f of x, the function, so this thing here, is equal to 1 plus the natural log of 2. So let's pop that in. So we have the natural log of, wherever I see an x, I'm going to put an e cubed. So e cubed minus a plus b is equal to this expression. So 1 plus the natural log of 2. <clears throat> and the first thing I think here is, can I somehow make the two equations look similar? And there is a way I can actually do this. So what I'm going to do on this side is I'm going to minus b from both sides. And you'll see why we're going to do that in about a couple of minutes. So minus b from both sides, this cancels. So I'm trying to make one side of the equation look the same for each equation. So here I get the natural log of minus a is equal to 1 minus b. And here I'm going to do this in one step here. I'm going to minus b from both sides, but I'm also going to minus the natural log of 2 from both sides as well. So I'm going to do this in one step. Hopefully you'll find with that at home. So this cancels, which is the most important thing. And don't forget, I've got a minus natural log of two. So natural log of e cubed minus a minus the natural log of two is equal to, well, this cancels here, but I've still got a one minus b. And by doing uh, this equation, moving things around, is you'll notice the right-hand side of both equations 
are the same, 1 minus b and 1 minus b. And if that is the case, that means the left-hand sides of each equation must also be the same. So what I'm saying here is that natural log of minus a is equal to this expression over here. Now I know that, I can write down now that natural log of minus a is equal to the natural log of e cubed minus a minus the natural log of 2. And I'm definitely making progress at this point. Now remember, one of our log laws is that when you're minusing two logs, it's the same as dividing. So I can now simplify this side here to the natural log of e cubed minus a over 2. So this is using, I think it's the second log law that we like to call it. Now the reason I've done this is you can actually cancel the logs. What we're actually doing here is raising both sides to the power of e only when you have natural log something equals natural log something. So I'm only allowed to do this once I have that. And if I don't, then I'm not allowed to do it. So once I've got it in this form, I can cancel the natural logs, raising both sides to the power of e. And that gives me now an equation to work with. So minus a equals e cubed minus a over 2. Now remember, e cubed here is just a number. So I can actually solve this for a. <coughs> the easiest way of doing this, well, let's get rid of the fraction. So what's the opposite of dividing by 2? Well, that's times by 2 on both sides. That gives us minus 2a is equal to, well, this cancels, e cubed minus a. And now we've got a little bit of equation solving to do here. So what I'm going to do is add a on both sides. I think this is the most straightforward way. Minus 2a plus a is minus a. This cancels, giving us e cubed. And now we just want to get a on its own. So we can flip the signs to get a is equal to minus e cubed, <coughs> like so. So we've got our value for a here. So a is equal to minus e cubed. And now we need to work out what b is here. And probably the easiest part here is to substitute it into this equation. So let me write that over here, we'll keep the same color. So we've got natural log of minus a uh, plus b is equal to 1. So I'm going to take this equation here. Now we know what minus a is equal to. It's e cubed. So we substitute that in. So natural log of e cubed plus b is equal to 1. <coughs> now remember, the natural log and e are opposite operations here. So they cancel each other out, leaving us with 3. And then we just need to get b on its own, minusing 3 from both sides, giving us minus 2 as our answer for b. So a really nice question, a nice mixture of transformations of functions at the start. Then we have to use our natural log laws in order to actually work out the equation. And then at that point, we do some substituting in as well. So I like how they've constructed this question. I think it's a good way of really stretching that knowledge that we've done on the higher level applications course. So show you the mark scheme here so you can look through exactly the steps that I've done. Right, this is the paper finished. So all 17 questions I've gone through. If you have missed out some of the questions, you can go right back to the start with questions one to four and you'll see that video right in front of you. Any requests for any other videos and please let me know in the comments below and I'll certainly look into it. Right, bye bye for now.